Good afternoon. On January the 21st of this year, the CDC announced that the first case of COVID-19 arrived in the United States in Washington State. Uh, that day, uh, according to our two speakers, marked a turning point in their research and vaccine development, a turning point that was expected as much it was, as it was unexpected. In the United States alone, according to Johns Hopkins, COVID-19 takes almost 1,000 lives every day. We've lost nearly 215,000 family members, colleagues, friends, and people we never met in these past nine months. The race for a vaccine and treatment is urgent, and our speakers today are running hard in this race, which is a marathon and not a sprint, and we want them to finish and win soon. As a physician and director of the Medical Humanities Program here at Baylor University, I have a little insight into their jobs. What I do know is that I'm honored to welcome both of them as friends and colleagues of our university. So let's cover a few logistical items as we begin. First, this presentation is being recorded and we'll email you a post-event link to view the session at a later date or to share. Second, we have hundreds of people participating today. However, the only people that you see on your screen will be our speakers. The public chat has been turned off for this presentation, but we would love for you to submit your questions at any time, and we'll address those once our speakers have finished. Please type them into the box at the bottom of your screen labeled Q&A, and I'll do my best to group similar questions together as we consider relevancy at in time. Finally, I'm grateful that so many uh, Baylor Bears are in attendance today, especially our alumni from the Medical Humanities Program and our students who've joined us today and alumni all over the country and all over the world. We know that you're making a difference in healthcare during these challenging times and we're humbled and grateful. And this is actually the first event that's being uh, co-sponsored by the Baylor Alumni Medical Alliance that we want you all to know about. And this involves alumni who are working in and around healthcare all over the world. And these gatherings are gonna be open to Baylor graduates who are active in any medical field. The Medical Alliance works very closely with the Baylor alumni to host events in major cities, and we want to bring events in a city near you. And we wanna invite you to participate in the Medical Alliance, and we're looking for leaders in groups all across the country. So you can contact me or Christy Harper. Uh, you can go to the website at uh, Baylor alumni, uh, baylor.edu slash alumni to learn more about our Medical Alliance. On to why we're here. Dr. Hotez is the Dean of the National School of Tropical Medicine and Professor of Pediatrics and Molecular Virology and Microbiology at Baylor College of Medicine, where he's also the Director of the Texas Children's Center for Vaccine Development and the Texas Children's Hospital Endowed Chair of Tropical Pediatrics. He also holds an appointment in the biology department here at Baylor University, and we're very proud of that. I remember the very first time I met Dr. Hotez, and as I was shaking his hand, one of the things he said was that science alone will never solve our problems. And yet he is uh, well known as a scientist and uh, as a pediatrician and advocacy um, spokesperson for, um, for uh, tropical diseases and uh, a spokesperson that you'll see all over the country in CNN and uh, all over the media outlets. And so we're delighted to have him today with us, Dr. Hotez. Well, thank you very much uh, for having me. It's uh, an honor to be here, Dr. Barron. I'm only sorry that uh, I can't be here in person. Actually, I'm sorry that uh, Dr. Patazzi and I can't be here in person. We've been coming to visit Waco at least once a semester and sometimes two or three times a semester uh, ever since we came to Texas uh, a decade ago. And it's the highlight of our year is always is when we uh, come to come to the beautiful uh, Baylor University campus and where we're both uh, professors and that's a role that we cherish uh, greatly. We love our interactions with Baylor University, love the students and we always feel energized uh, every time we visit. So I'm very sad uh, I'm not there today, but hopefully after this apocalypse ends, uh, we'll, we'll both be visiting again uh, soon. Uh, what Mary Lane and I are gonna do is uh, sort of tag team. I'm going to give a 
maybe 20, 25 minute presentation. And then uh, we're going to do our questions and answers uh, for uh, the rest of the hour. And unfortunately, I have to leave a little early to go on CNN, as Dr. Barron uh, mentioned, but uh, I'm sure we'll get some things done and at least start the conversation around COVID-19 vaccines. And I'm sure this is something that we can uh, continue uh, afterwards. I'm gonna share my screen and always amazed when the technology actually works. And here we go. So uh, I think for today, we'll focus uh, predominantly on uh, our COVID-19 vaccine work. And what I'd like to do is put it into a, a larger uh, context. Um, we're now at around 30 million cases and a million deaths. And, and uh, this was a book uh, called Blue Marble Health that I gave a talk about a, few, a couple of years back when I was at Waco and it talked about diseases of the poor living amid wealth. And the idea was we had used World Health Organization data and Institute for Health Metrics data to show that uh, su a surprising amount of the world's poverty related diseases like leprosy and leishmaniasis and dengue and tuberculosis actually occurs in wealthy economies, but it's the poor living among the wealthy so that these are health disparities. And now I've, we've just, I've just done a new update to that book that you can download for free on Johns Hopkins Project News is called Poverty and the Impact of COVID-19, the Blue Marble Health Approach. And it shows that uh, COVID-19, it looks like it's going by the same playbook, that it's uh, overwhelmingly in G20 countries, especially the countries lifted, listed on the left there, the US uh, probably leads in the number of cases and deaths tragically, but India and Brazil are not far behind. And Russia's terrible, South Africa, Mexico, and Saudi Arabia. Again, it's predominantly uh, people living in low-income neighborhoods in, in these countries, although that's not an idea that's widely discussed. So for instance, here's a typical day of uh, deaths from COVID-19 here in Houston. What happens is the Houston Health Department puts out a list of people who've perished in our COVID epidemic in, in the city, and they don't provide names, but they provide uh, sex, age, and race or ethnicity. And you can see the huge number of Hispanics uh, affected by, and Latino community is affected by COVID-19. And this is something that both Mary Elaine and I are trying to give attention to. Uh, I testified at the Congressional Hispanic Caucus a couple of weeks back and made the statement that uh, this virus is causing, quote, historic decimation, unquote, of, of Latino Hispanic communities. And and I very much believe that. And it's still not an idea that has really been well, well vetted and, and discussed and, and hoping to raise more awareness. So we've been talking to individuals here in Texas. Uh, we've had some, we've had a number of discussions with Beto O'Rourke and members of Congress to see how we can address this problem. And it's happening in the metro areas, but also uh, certainly in, in South Texas as well. And and not even just the border, places like Victoria and Corpus Christi are really getting hit very hard uh, this year. Now, in terms of making vaccines, uh, I like to point out that uh, this is not as daunting a task as you might think. Uh, this is a cartoon on the right, upper right. Everyone has seen a cartoon of the COVID-19 virus, the SARS coronavirus type two, and recognizes those spikes emanating out. Almost all of the vaccines uh, that are in play are looking at strong immune responses to those spike proteins, uh, both through virus neutralizing antibody as well as uh, T cell responses. On the left is a slide that Dr. Tony Fauci presented at uh, the uh, NIH over the summer. And you can see that uh, Baylor is prominently featured here. So in Dr. Fauci's slide, so we're part of what's sometimes called the race for a vaccine, although it's not really a race, it's, it's trying to get as many different vaccines out there in order to cover the entire global population. And the idea is by having, looking at multiple different technologies, all directed against inducing an immune response to the spike protein will increase our shots on goal for the likelihood of having a safe and effective vaccine. So we're uh, shaping a recombinant protein vaccine uh, here at Baylor, but we have nanoparticle vaccines that's being produced by Novavax. A lot of these are pharma companies, uh, RNA and DNA immunization by Inovio and Moderna and uh, Pfizer. 
the adenovirus-based vaccine by J&J &J and Oxford AstraZeneca and even live attenuated vaccines. But again, all of them are inducing an immune response to the spike protein and operating by producing high levels of virus neutralizing antibody. Let me just go into a little more detail here, the different types of vaccines. This is from a, our, not our paper, but a review in Nature. And I liked it because of the, the, the figure. So uh, one of the major types is an adenovirus-based vectored vaccine. It's called a non-replicating virus. This is what the J&J &J and uh, uh, AstraZeneca Oxford vaccine platform uses, but also the Russian vaccine uses, and one of the Chinese vaccines uses this. So an adenovirus vector is a common mode of uh, trying to induce an immune response to the spike protein. We also have replicating viruses. This will come out later next year. Merkin Company is developing two of them, one using a vesicular stomatitis virus, similar to the, their Ebola vaccine, as well as measles. You have an inactivated virus vaccine. The Chinese are producing one of those. It's uh, from a company called Sinovac, as well as an Indian company, uh, Bharat uh, Biotech in, in Hyderabad, looking at even weakened viruses. That's uh, another approach. And, and then we get into the nucleic acid vaccines, uh, the Moderna and Pfizer vaccines work by uh, producing a piece of RNA encoding part of the spike protein of the virus to induce an immune response that then replicates in the cytoplasm to produce proteins. And so we're kind of engineering our own protein and immune response. Uh, DNA vaccines are another strategy from Inovio where they electroporate the vaccine into the skin and then it's taken up into the nucleus, made into RNA and then protein and then Here's our protein subunit vaccines, and there are other ones as well. Sanofi uh, has one, and then a virus-like particle, such as uh, the one out of Novavax. And again, all inducing immune responses to the spike protein. And the idea behind it is that we want these vaccines, by inducing these virus-neutralizing antibodies, to reduce severity of illness, preventing you from going to the hospital. And then in an ideal situation, it also blocks the actual infection. And you might say, well, this, shouldn't that be the same? Well, not necessarily. So for instance, in an influenza vaccine, in a year where there's not a good match between the virus and the vaccine, what happens is you induce, uh, 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 re re induce an immune response that reduces your severity of illness, but you could still get the flu. Uh, the same thing could happen with some of these COVID-19 vaccines. We don't really know which ones will reduce severity of illness and which will actually block the infection. Ideally, you'd like to meet both profiles because then if you can block the infection and enough people get vaccinated, then you actually can induce herd immunity to interrupt transmission, which would be really exciting. And then most of the vaccines so far require uh, at least two doses, although there's some newer ones coming along like the J&J &J one that may be a single dose uh, vaccine. So the U.S. program is known as Operation Warp Speed, as many know, and it's, this is a public-private partnership between the U.S. government and many of the pharma companies. And the Warp Speed part is around building factories now primarily. So whether or not we know these vaccines work, they're already being scaled up and produced. So once we can show they work, then they're ready to release. It's not so much that the clinical trials are, are being rushed, uh, as many sometimes erroneously believe. And then we've got, we're gonna have at least two waves of these vaccines. There's uh, about seven or eight in all in Operation Warp Speed. That first wave is coming to fruition now in phase three clinical trials, two mRNA vaccines for Moderna and Pfizer and adenovirus-based vaccine for AstraZeneca Oxford. And the hope is by November, December, we'll have data to show whether these vaccines actually work and are safe and then they can be released to the public through emergency use authorization with a second wave of uh, other vaccines to follow, Novavax, J&J, &J, Sanofi, Merck and Company. One of the questions I'm always asked, and which I don't like to answer is they say, Dr. Hotez, which, uh, which of these vaccines would you take for you or your family? And, and my answer is somewhat idiosyncratic. I say, look, we're not gonna have that kind of choice. You don't know what vaccine you're, you're, that's gonna be made easily available to you. So don't wait. Whatever comes along first, for instance, that's approved, I'm going to take a recommend from my family because I don't wanna go into the winter when we expect COVID-19 to go back up. Uh, I don't wanna go into the winter with, without having neutralizing antibodies on board. So I will take whatever vaccine I can get. 
knowing that it may not be the best vaccine that's out there, but, uh, but the hope that later on in the year I can get a boost uh, maybe from one of the other vaccines, but don't wait. Do whatever you can to get virus neutralizing antibodies into your system uh, now. So the advantages of Operation Warp Speed is of course the accelerated timetable, very high in the innovation factor because they use technologies that have never uh, been used before. And, and part of that is to get as many different uh, approaches as possible and of course manufacturing a risk, whether we know, know it works or not. Now the disadvantages are uh, as, as in some ways same as the advantages, new, new technology, never been used before, high in the innovation, but also a lot of uncertainty with that. Uh, will these vaccines have durable protection? Will they be safe in the long haul? That's something that's not known. And so both Mary Lane and I have been pushing hard with the idea that maybe this Operation Warp Speed should be balanced out a bit more with some of the old school vaccines, established technologies like a recombinant protein vaccine similar to the hepatitis B vaccine, or an activated virus vaccine similar to uh, say the Salk uh, polio vaccine. Another disadvantage of Operation Warp Speed is the, the vaccines may be expensive to produce. Some of them like the Pfizer vaccine requires minus 94 degrees uh, uh, storage, so a deep, deep freeze. And essentially that means you're not gonna be able to go to HEB and Kroger and get your Pfizer RNA vaccine. They won't have the capacity for that. So it'll require specialty places uh, for it. Some of the vaccines may be available in pharmacies in time, but not probably the first few that have come out. Also, uh, there's a problem. There has not been a very good communication strategy around Operation Warp Speed. They've allowed the companies to be in the lead, the pharma companies, and that messaging has not gone well, particularly because three of the, the of the first three companies producing vaccines, AstraZeneca, neither AstraZeneca, Oxford, or um, or uh, Moderna are vaccine companies and they've made a lot of missteps. And I think they, that's been a problem because they don't realize the importance of public perception. Vaccines have their own unique ecosystem and it doesn't take much for a vaccine to not be used because a company is not messaging right. So we've got, we're gonna have to fix that. The other problem is there's not the same level of international cooperation uh, that we've uh, seen in the past. And the US has adopted this go it alone strategy because they've, our government has pulled out of the vaccine sharing facility known as COVAX and also pulled out of the World Health Organization. So we've got this problem in, this, in our nation that some are calling vaccine nationalism, where we talk about the Chinese vaccine, the Russian vaccine, the British vaccine. The truth is we've never spoken about vaccines in that context. It's always been about international sharing. And this is actually hurting our ability to uh, both develop vaccines to get vaccines uh, out there safely. And in its place, uh, what we've been always pushing hard for, I served as uh, science, US science envoy for vaccines uh, in the last administration with State Department and White House to get an international cooperation. It's a throwback to when Albert Sabin developed the oral polio vaccine. He did it jointly, uh, not many people realize this, with the USSR the Soviet scientists at the height of the Cold War, the two countries uh, put aside their ideologies to work together to make the polio vaccine in the late 50s, early 60s, after the Sputnik launch and there's cooperation around the smallpox vaccine. And we've kind of gotten away from that. And I think that that we're gonna have to fix as well. The other big issue is as complicated as Operation Warp Speed is, I'm really, and the, the problem that we've had in the US, I'm very worried about what's happening globally where we've got the large urban uh, mega cities in Latin America and India and Africa. You know, how do you do social distancing in Belém or Fortaleza or in Guayaquil, uh, in Ecuador or in Mumbai or Delhi and, or in Lagos and Nigeria? And I'm re really worried this virus is gonna race through and cause a lot of uh, destruction. So uh, what Mary Elaine and I have done is through our Texas Children's Center for Vaccine Development, uh, with, which is part of our School of Tropical Medicine, the Baylor College of Medicine. We've teamed up with this very interesting organization on this path, which is Seattle-based and has historically done a lot of work with the Gates Foundation to develop the meningococcal vaccine for Africa, the malaria vaccine for Africa. Now they're partnering with us to scale up our COVID vaccine, which is a recombinant protein vaccine. And it's 
uh, this is our Texas Children, what we call CVD, the Center for Vaccine Development, where we've uh, been to Waco many times talking about our work to develop low-cost global health vaccines uh, for combating parasitic infections. And we've spoken, spoken multiple times in Waco about our parasitic disease vaccines. What we probably haven't really spoken about before is about a, a decade ago, we uh, started partnering with the New York Blood Center with a group led by Lan Ying Du and Shi Bu Jiang, who had discovered a very interesting approach for coronavirus vaccines. And at the time, there was very little interest in coronavirus vaccines. So we kind of adopted uh, their programs, or sort of an orphan program for SARS and MERS. And now, of course, there's a lot of interest in coronavirus vaccines. But uh, our, together, our approach has been to look at the spike protein of the coronavirus, which is a trimeric protein. And if you look at the green part here, that's the receptor binding them, the piece that actually docks with the host receptor. And we were able to show for SARS and MERS that this can induce high levels of virus neutralizing antibody and uh, protect laboratory animals against challenge infection and without some of the immune side effects that's sometimes known as immune enhancement that you might be hearing about. And so we've been uh, scaling up production of these vaccines and now we've done this for the receptor binding domain of the SARS-2 coronavirus and are producing now a billion doses with our collaborators in India known as Biological E. So they are, as we speak, are producing a billion doses of uh, the vaccine that we've developed at Baylor and Texas Children's. And that's extremely exciting for us to be able to have a, a global health uh, impact. Uh, the uh, the vac Our vaccine is produced in a yeast known as Pickia pastoris. And you might say, well, why do I care that it's a yeast known as Pickia pastoris, these budding, green budding yeast seen here on faux color scanning EM? Well, the reason it's relevant is that Pickia or a related yeast called Hensenula has been used for uh, since the 1980s to develop uh, and did a recombinant protein hepatitis B vaccines in Bangladesh and Brazil and Cuba and India and Indonesia. So we can potentially plug and play into those systems in order to have them produce uh, our COVID-19 vaccine. So it's a way to address the problem of those terrible, the, the, as the disease races through the crowded urban slums of the mega cities of Africa, Asia, and, and Latin America. So Mary Lane and I are on, on tele Zoom calls day and night with various countries discussing how we can do that technology transfer in collaboration with a biological E. Uh, to finish up, I'll just say one of the other things we're worried about is uh, we've been we've seen now many surveys coming out of Reuters and the Associated Press and elsewhere to, to find that a significant percentage of Americans will refuse COVID-19 vaccines even if they're made available. And I think part of this is the mess the lack of messaging out of Operation Warp Speed that there's a perception that these vaccines are are not safe or not adequately tested for safety, and it's in part because there's been a very aggressive anti-vaccine movement. Uh, out there was sadly a lot of it is based uh, here in Texas. And, you know, the anti-vaccine lobby claims that vaccines are, are rushed, are not adequately tested for safety, that there's conflicts between the U.S. government and the pharma companies, and that there's con this conspiratorial relationship, and there's this kind of fake concept out there known as health freedom uh, that says government <coughs> can interfere with what we're doing. And and all of this is uh, Operation Warp Speed is definitely playing into that by their lack of communication. So this has created a real problem now in that the anti-vaccine movement has ironically gotten re-energized uh, because of COVID-19. And of course, then there's the old assertion that I've spoken in Waco about many times that vaccines cause autism and, and fighting that as well. So these health freedom protests are causing a lot of damage and since 2015, they were focused around uh, vaccines, but now in this year of COVID, they've glommed on campaigns against social distancing and contact tracing and masks. And this is one of the reasons we've had, you know, something like 17,000 people who've died of COVID-19 in Texas, people defiant of social distancing and masks is actually affecting uh, the public health of our state uh, and of our nation. And we've had this problem of a steep rise in the number of kids who are denied access to vaccines 
uh, because their parents erroneously believe vaccines are harmful, when in fact it's all part of this misinformation movement. And a lot of it's based in the center of Texas, including around Waco and, and Austin area. So this has become a real hotbed of the anti-vaccine uh, movement. And then on the other piece, the claims that vaccines cause autism, I've been fighting that for a few years now because as many know, I have, a, I have four adult kids, including Rachel who has autism and other intellectual disabilities. And uh, so I wrote this book, Vaccines Did Not Cause Rachel's Autism, to go into detail, explaining the science showing there's no link between vaccines and autism, uh, but also explaining what autism is and how we've identified more than 100 genes involved in early fetal brain development, including uh, we did whole exome sequencing uh, on Rachel and my wife and I, Anne and I, and we found one of those uh, genes. So, uh, so I think there's a whole other narrative there that we can come back and, and talk about some other time. And unfortunately, the, this anti-vaccine, which is now a full-on anti-science movement, is globalizing. And, and again, Lauren, this is, Dr. Barron, this is a, you know, an important role for medical humanities to figure out a way to counteract this. We've got now uh, the Russian government uh, through their media agency, RT, which used to stand for Russia, Russia Today, has been filling up the internet with fake anti-vaccine messages on social media. You've also got um, uh, the, uh, this is now a, a bit a big problem in European capitals, their anti-mask, anti-vaccine protests held in Berlin and London and Paris uh, this fall. Uh, RFK Jr., Robert F. Kennedy Jr. is one of the lead anti-vaxxers. Uh, was in Germany last uh, and at the end of August, where he spoke, and and CBS reports that the rally was sponsored by neo-Nazi groups and QAnon, and so this has really become very ominous, and I think it's something we're going to have to work hard to counteract. So I'll stop here to say that I think you know we're involved in what looks like to me an epic struggle of trying to do the science and developing vaccines, yet we're opposed by all of these. 21st century forces like poverty and climate change, war, political collapse, urbanization, and anti-science. And this is the title of my new book. It'll be out early next year called Preventing the Next Pandemic, Vaccine Diplomacy in a Time of Anti-Science. And I started writing it before COVID, almost finished it before COVID because about because I we were already seeing an unraveling of uh, people getting vaccinated and people treated for their neglected diseases through these 21st century forces. And I, I like showing this slide, especially today, because you know, in the medical professions, these are not things that we're ordinarily trained to think about, poverty and climate change and war and political collapse, urbanization and anti-science. And But guess what? This is why we have something called medical humanities, to bring these things in. And I think medical humanities is going to become so important moving forward in order to train people to think about these things. And right now, we're not set up for it. But I think this is going to be an important wave in the future. So uh, I'll stop there. And then maybe we could uh, do our uh, panel with uh, Dr. Batazzi. And, and uh, I'm in your hands, Lauren. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Hotez. Um, we'd like to bring in Dr. Maria Elena Botazzi, who's uh, Associate Dean of the National School of Tropical Medicine and Professor of Pediatrics and the co-director of the Texas Children's Center for Vaccine Development at Baylor College of Medicine. And she's also a distinguished professor of biology here at Baylor. And she and Dr. Uh, Hotez have been uh, friends and colleagues and partners for quite some time now. And Dr. Padazzi, let me just ask you to comment on um, the things that Dr. Hotez has just shared with us. What are your thoughts and reflections on what he's just shared with us? Yes, thank you so much, Lauren. Uh, uh, as Peter said, we are beyond delighted to be with you, uh, um, helping also raise this awareness that biology needs to pair up with all these other disciplines, the social sciences, uh, maybe even beyond that, I mean, we work very closely with health economists, we work very closely even with engineers, with, uh, of course, the legal framework, we need lawyers, right, to be able to put together uh, the policies that make sense. So I think for me, the, the, the overarching comment is interdisciplinarity that we need to now stop uh, addressing um, problems of the world in silos, as you know, we are 
now are trying as targets to address the sustainable development goals, which are quite, quite I have to say, uh, audacious. Um, you know, like Peter said, not only in the area of health, but certainly in the area of um, the earth, the climate, you know, the um, certainly the, you know, the poverty, you know, everything. Uh, and so it's try to work a little bit more in concerted matter, manners, um, partnerships, collaboration. And Peter, actually, the one point that I think it's really the one that it's um, very much showing where a lot of the collapse that we've been seeing is in the area of co communications. Because we could certainly be collaborating among ourselves, but if the information is not translated in a manner that the general public can understand it, that our policymakers and of course political leaders can, you know, rally and champion around them, uh, that our media also are putting putting them out in a way that it's not in fact causing more misinformation that you know real information. So you know we can be well excellent scientists. We can of course be excellent medical human humanists. We can certainly be uh, professionals. But if we do not translate this in a manner that it is well communicated with clear uh, governance and clear leadership, you know that is where most of the collapse we're seeing. And mm -hmm. the, maybe the last thing, Lauren, that I'm going to say is that I know that we all think very individually because of course we want to protect ourselves and our families. We certainly also think very much within our community that we live. You know, those of you who live in Waco, those of us who may live in, in, in Houston, those of us indeed who live in the US, at the end of the day, we still are a global world. So even if we speak to how can we address things in the context of high income economies, like we have the, 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 the luxury of living within, you know, in a, in a US economy, that unfortunately we have a lot of underserved populations. And indeed anything that we do also has a huge impact globally. And I think this is why our school is so aligned with uh, Baylor University, because we are here to serve and to serve the world and to serve all the populations around the globe that needs it. So everything that we do, we want to see it in the perspective that we need to tackle this pandemic as a global pandemic as it is. Um, and so the strategy should, should be scalable and transferable. So I'm going to stop there, Lauren, so we can start some Q&A. Thank you. Thank you so much. So important. Um, so could you, could you each say something about your own medical and academic training that prepared you for this point in time? What do you think were some of the most important uh, parts of your training that prepared you to take on this work that you're taking on now? Peter, do you want to start or do you want me to? Uh, yeah, I'll say a few words. You know, it's interesting how the, my career is uh, both stayed the same and yet changed. So when I was as an undergraduate at Yale, I wanted to develop vaccines for parasitic diseases. And, and 40 years later, I'm still doing that. And that has always been a constant in terms of the science. I think the difference the change is, I never thought I'd be uh, involved in public engagement and uh, things like international diplomacy, fighting anti-science, all, all the, some of the things, all the policy and advocacy that I'm in some ways better known for than, than even the science. And, and so that's, that's been the big change. And it really, came out of the fact that uh, there, was, there was a vacuum. And the vacuum was nobody was speaking out, defending science, explaining science, uh, take, looking after, using science for humanitarian goals. So I would say uh, that's been the one game-changing piece, really very much becoming involved in medical humanities. Uh, and I love both, uh, even though sometimes it gets challenging to keep up with the grants and the papers and the lab meetings on the one hand and do all of the public engagement on the other. I think that's a common feature probably for both Mary Lynn and I is, is that we feel both are extremely meaningful and important and therefore 
it just means we have to get a little less sleep and wake up and start Zoom calls at five and end the Zoom calls at 10. Uh, <laughs> other than that, it's been an amazing ride. Dr. Patazzi, how about you? Well, sure. So uh, maybe many of you know, I, I actually was raised in Honduras, um, you know, a small country, certainly in the lowest of the income uh, uh, types of countries. I also, from very early on in age, I was fascinated by um, parasitology and even, I'm a microbiologist, but within the microbiological field, parasites and worms and, and, and you know, the same diseases that Peter was interested, you know, I was also very much drawn towards. And also because in these types of countries, of course, afflict a lot of um, children and a lot of our populations. I think for me, the thing that, that uh, was very interesting in, the, in how my career ended up shaping as is that, you know, even though I was very interested in the science, as Peter said, I actually was drawn into the business side of science. And, and by business side of science, I mean, indeed, what are the business practices that you use to try to really rally into deploying these types of science interventions or global health interventions, in our case, of course, vaccines, and how do you really operationalize them uh, logistically and, and coordination and management and finances. And, and because I do come from a, uh, fine, you know, like a business family, I'm the only scientist probably. Um, I ended up when I was doing one of my postdoc trainings in the Philadelphia area, where you, you know that up in the Northeast, there's a lot of uh, ecosystem in this area of pharmaceutical companies. I ended up starting a business administration degree where it put me a lot into the case studies of how big farm I used to manage, um, you know, development of medicines and development of vaccines. And then when we met with Peter again, 20 years ago, he brought the, the, of course, the, the same science interest. We were de co-developing this, this business model of how do we do vaccine development for underserved populations or for back diseases that are for the poor we needed to find a business model. So I kind of tried to shepherd that and design this product development partnership approach plus, and then he, he was the one who really also rallied me into this whole you know, advocacy and communication. And, and even though I'm by no means as savvy as Peter as a spokesperson, but I have learned so much on how to certainly speak uh, which is an art. It's, it's, it's not easy to, to speak, you know, in public, while at the same time behind the scenes, I do a lot of the business operations. Yes. Thank I think, you I so think much. One, one, other, one other thing, uh, and by the way, Mary Elaine is being extremely modest. She is <laughs> very powerful. She's become a very powerful policy and health advocate, especially for the Latin America region, which is now being deprived of COVID-19 vaccines. She's become an important spokesperson for you know, for a billion people in, in the region in the Southern Hemisphere. I think the other thing that's, that surprised me is, you know, I, I love books and uh, I've always been an avid reader and I always wanted to become a writer and I was always too scared to do it. And finally, about a decade ago, really coinciding with the move to Texas, I said, just, I'm just going to do it. And, um, and now uh, I've had four books published, single author books, and they're not great books, but they, <laughs> but, they um, but uh, you know, they, they provide an important outlet for me to really convey my passion for science diplomacy, vaccine diplomacy, and uh, I find it, even though I, even though I look at them, I say they're not great books. They're good books, and they convey some unique thoughts, and I find that very, I find that very meaningful. So, uh, in many ways, I've become a medical humanities person. <laughs> That's wonderful. I have a question here from Dr. Sharon Stern, who's a friend and colleague and director of student health services here at Baylor. And she says that she understands that vaccines are going to be released initially for higher risk groups, at least until production can be ramped up. And she wants to know uh, what your insight is into when the vaccines will be available for the general public. 
Well, I can give you my point of view. If you, if you saw the list that Peter showed, which are the, like the tier one, which most likely will be the ones who are going to be approved for emergency use and also specifically for very key target populations. But then we're gonna have that second wave, which we think hopefully ours even could be folded into those second wave, which are the ones who are gonna be much more scalable because again, they may even use um, technologies that are already proven and there's already an ecosystem in manufacturing. Uh, but there also may be the learnings from the first wave with regards to what are the safety concerns or maybe even how much efficacy and what exactly we can even identify what makes a vaccine work. So probably those are gonna start rolling out starting next spring, next summer. So I honestly don't foresee that for general public, we won't have vaccines available until the summer into the latter third and fourth quarter of 2021. Then you can ask me when in fact vaccines could even arrive to low middle income countries, for example, right? So I know that there's right now some attempts to at least offer up to 20% of the world's population access to some vaccine. But even within that initial 20%, um, we, they're actually first targeting only the first 3% of any country's population. And, and we, of course, are worried because you can have access to 3%, but then you're gonna have to deploy the other 17%, but then you still have 80% of the rest of the world. And I think it's a combination, again, not really knowing which vaccines will be available and approved, how good are they manufactured, and how scalable it is, and of course, cost. But I think this is going to start early in 2021. For the first year, we're gonna see some targeted delivery distribution. And I think it's gonna take us 2022, probably even all the way until 2023, and probably even longer than that, to really capture the delivery equitably around the globe. Okay. Thank you. I would, I would say that. I mean, I, the, what I've been saying is, look, by this time next year, I think we'll have a significant percentage of the U.S. population vaccinated. That's, that's my hope. But that's the time frame we're talking about. So um, I have good news and bad news. The good news is I think a year from now, our lives are going to be feel much safer, uh, especially for people my age uh, uh, th then than we do now. That's the good news. The not so good news or the bad news is I think we're in for a very rough winter. Numbers are really going to accelerate. Um, it's going to be a very scary time uh, in this country. And I think, you know, there's other things going to happen around, you know, like the political violence or foreign cyber attacks. I think this is going to be a very unstable time in American life this winter. Uh, Things will get better. They'll get better starting in the middle of the year, be a lot better by the fall. And so one of the things that I've been advising people, in fact, I'm going on CNN in a few minutes to talk about is, you know, look at how we look, get through this very rough patch this winter and looking after your mental health, your family's mental health, thinking about who you're social distancing with, try to avoid being alone uh, this winter because it is gonna be a frightening time and get ready for it. If you know it's coming, you can prepare for it. You can make decisions about, you know, which family members you're gonna be with, you know, if you're, if you're geographically separated, friends to be with. Now's the time to think about it because I think it's going to be a, a, I think it's gonna be a very rough winter for multiple reasons. Mm -hmm. Um, John UC is asking uh, if you would discuss the, some logistical issues surrounding the distribution of millions of vaccine doses, including who's going to administer those vaccines. Will it be in primary care offices? Uh, you mentioned something about retail pharmacies, uh, not to mention vaccine administration records and that sort of thing. Can you talk about logistics? Well, the problem is, you know, uh, you know, maybe Mary Elena knows more, but you know, we haven't heard a lot of communication about it. Again, this gets back to my statement I made during my talk. We've not had a communication strategy coming out of Operation Warp Speed. It's, it's, and, and it's by design. And I think that was a major flaw in the design. I think it's a good program with a lot of scientific rigor and 
I think the trials are run with a lot of integrity, uh, scientific integrity, but there was never a communication plan. So, you know, what you just, what was just asked is a very basic, obvious question to ask, and, and I don't know. Uh, you know, it's, there's been information sent to state and local health departments, but the communication has been horrible. So the American people don't really know that. Now, part of it is because they don't know the performance characteristics of the vaccines yet. They don't know if it's only gonna work in certain populations. They don't know um, uh, how effective they're gonna be, what the durability of immunity is. But I think by now we should be further ahead in the distribution plan. And I've been pushing very hard for the leaders of Operation Warp Speed to be out there in the public domain on a frequent and regular basis, almost like Andrew Cuomo was, you know, in March and April, maybe not every day, but once a week, every other week, sort of answering questions from the press so people know what to expect. And it's not happening. And I think that that's got to be fixed. The, the other thing I do know is that, at least in Texas, for example, that right now there is a website that healthcare providers or clinics or, of course, those who eventually have the ability of being able to uh, distribute vaccines have to go in and, and already pre-register or at least submit the intent that they are going to be um, part of the potential ecosystem. Um, if you look also, uh, the reality is, right, you know, and I think this is something that uh, falls not only in the U.S., but globally. Because the ecosystem for... For, deli for deliver and distribution, right? Uh, we know how to deliver and distribute pediatric vaccines, right? Because there is a whole expanded immunization programs that, you know, you know what to do if you're going to have to vaccinate your children. We may have some... Uh, uh, structure for, you know, for example, what we're seeing now with trying to ramp up the flu vaccine and certainly some vaccines for elderly, right, or adult or even, you know, teenagers when they have to show vaccination to go to BU, for example, right? But in an air, in, in a space of an outbreak, epidemic, and now pandemic, it doesn't exist. There is, there has never been a case where you're going to have to deploy vaccines for a pandemic of global proportion. So not in the US, we have a, 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 you know, like a, a book that tells you this is how you do it. And certainly not in the world we have. And even if you look at some of these coalitions that they were trying to what, you know, you know pandemic preparedness coalitions, they've always prepared for small outbreaks or maybe a small epidemic, but they clearly we heard in fact today, this morning on another call that that cookbook this doesn't apply to a pandemic. So I don't think anybody really knows. And, you know, there's going to be a lot of challenges. And I think that's why it's going to take a while. And Peter has uh, just said, we have, we're not hearing a lot in how it's going to be done. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, another question by G. Phillips about reinfection. So how do we know anything about how common reinfection with COVID is and what that means about the immune response to the virus? And have reinfections seem to be because uh, waning immune response is happening or is it because of antigenic change? And what do we know about adjuvants as far as helping to induce a more lasting response? So can you comment on reinfection? Lauren, let me answer the first part, then I have to drop off for uh, CNN, unfortunately. I apologize. Um, but uh, very briefly, you know, I do think people do develop immune responses to the virus as they would the vaccine, and it operates through neutralizing the antibody against the spike protein. We are hearing about second infections, and I think those are individuals who maybe did not have a significant initial infection, did not develop a very strong antibody response. So we know what occurs. I think it's going to be uh, uncommon. Uh, so I think most people who get the infection, they'll follow the same pattern as SARS-1. They get the infection, they recover, and they'll probably be immune for years or they'll get the vaccine. So I'm not as uh, worried uh, about that. We don't know for certain. Uh, we're always getting surprised by this virus, uh, but, but that's what it looks like. So I think most people, so I think most people do get, get immune responses. And with that, I'm going to take off and uh, leave you in 
better hands with Dr. Batak. <laughs> Thank you so Thank much. Thank you, Dr. Hotes. Thank you. Great opportunity. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks, Thank you. So maybe, Lauren, I can just add a couple of additional um, what information, what we at least think we know up to now. Please. Um, so with regards to, in fact, we are working with a group uh, from Duke University who will most likely have one of the validated tests that uh, is going to be able to determine how effective the, all these vaccines within Operation Warp Speed um, that are going, that are currently in phase three clinical trials. And he had told us that if you look at the level of virus nitro neutralizing antibodies in those who are asymptomatic, those who are of course symptomatic but have not severe disease, and then those who of course have severe disease, they're trying to right now benchmark those to then see when you then have a vaccination where do they fall with regards to do we you know all of them seem to be inducing uh, uh, neutralizing uh, antibodies but do they fall within not not very many as far as quantity right and of course quality and so there's a scale right that we you know and even though today we don't know what is what we call a correlate of saying you need to have more than x and therefore be you know, protected and long-term protected. I think all these data eventually, because they're gonna be um, done with a validated, you know, a standard assay, we are going to be able to get more evidence. Uh, so that's in the area again of, you know, uh, how much of our own natural immunity is going to be compared to the immunity that we want to either boost or enhance uh, uh, with vaccines or induce if of course it's to be given to individuals who have not been exposed before. Now I think there was the, the um, topic on adjuvants and I think you're, you're, you know, you're bringing a very interesting topic because uh, again vaccines are not necessarily single components you know so it's a, it's, it's a, it's a formulation which of course it's either in, in you know as an example an RNA packaged into something that will be delivered. In our case, it's a protein that is, of course, paired with some, again, adjuvant to induce or boost the immune response or to balance. You know, we've been hearing a lot about we have to induce antibodies, but it has to also be balanced with a cellular response and a cytokine response. And, and you're right. I mean, I think that's also some in the area of vaccine development challenging because for example, uh, the adjuvant that is the most widely used adjuvant in many, many already licensed vaccines, which is aluminum, it actually was not one of the adjuvants that was considered early on um, as part of these vaccine development programs. And I think that was a huge mistake because it also brought in or excluded a component that we had a lot of evidence of, of prior use of, of, of course, safety in other vaccines. It's affordable. It's, there's a, a lot of access to, uh, globally. And so unfortunately, all these new technologies kind of like left it off the table. We are now seeing that we, it's kind of like, br it's starting to bring, to come back into the mix. For example, our vaccine does include a formulation that uses aluminum because it also wants to keep the cost down. Um, so we're starting to see also new adjuvants probably going to be evaluated. So it, again, the, it's, it's, a, it's such a complex um, uh, production process also because then you're saying, okay, who's gonna make you know, the actual protein or the RNA or the DNA or the vector? Who's gonna make the adjuvant? But then there's who's making the vials, who's making the caps, who's making the syringes, who's making, right? So all that supply chain it's, you know, it, it has to be available at this enormous doses. And one thing that it's doing, unfortunately, it's probably taking a little bit from Peter to give it to Paul. So we also, right, because the, the supply was already maybe reserved for other vaccines, or even the fact that we are dealing with distributing deliveries of other vaccines and we're losing the, the, the um, ability of also taking attention to other vaccines that are supposed to be also be done in the context of the pandemic, right? 
So Barry, thank you for that answer. It's very complicated. I'm seeing so many questions that unfortunately we weren't able to get to, but this gives us lots of ideas for topics to discuss in the future, Dr. Badazi. And you and Dr. Hotez have been wonderful about being willing to do that. So I hope we can get you back again. Absolutely. Um, so this has been a wonderful discussion and unfortunately we're at time. And on behalf of Baylor Medical Humanities Program and Baylor Alumni Engagement, I wanna thank you, Dr. Batazzi, and, uh, and thank Dr. Hotez, who's probably on CNN right now, if you're ready to change your channel, um, for, uh, for all of your work. And we want you to know that you have the prayers and support of the Baylor community who've all joined in today. And uh, we want to remind you to be uh, looking for ways to engage with the medical um, alumni, the Baylor Alumni Medical Alliance. And uh, you can email us at the baylor.edu slash alumni website. And we thank you all for being with us today and have a good day.